Hello, I'm Angelo Vermeulen. This is the second post podcast at the Dome of Visions in Stockholm dealing with the future of space exploration. I have two guests today. On my left side we have Rebecca Millerstad and on my right side is Kevin Noon. Rebecca is an uh, agronomist, which is the science of agriculture, if I understood well. Her focus is interdisciplinary research from a systems perspective about farm resilience, multifunctional agriculture, and local organic food networks. And one of her projects is titled Healthy Growth from Niche to Volume with Integrity, Integrity and Trust. And then Kevin Noon has a background in environmental engineering, atmospheric physics, and oceanograph oceanography. He is currently working at the Stockholm Resilience Center, among others, because you have quite a FCV as well, both of you. And his primary research interests are in the area of atmospheric chemistry and physics and sustainability science. So both of my guests today are uh, specialized in um, treating the world in a different way. And so we're going to talk about how we're going to bring ecology, farming into outer space, into the future. Uh, yeah, to help us with exploring the universe. So I would love to um, to hear from you a little more in depth what your background is. So maybe we can start with Rebecca. Yes, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, as you said, I'm an agronomist, which is something that's not... Um, it's a word that's not very common in Swedish either. When I was a high school student, I was the only one who went to an information day of, from that university, agricultural university at my, in my school, and nobody knew, knew what that word me meant. But actually it's about how to produce food, uh, what farmers do, and how farmers think. So it's, both, it's a very interdisciplinary field in itself, because okay. it's about using, using nature for the purposes of human food production, but mm -hmm. also about people who actually do it, and the animals, of course. So there's also a cultural aspect there? Yes, I mean it, it, the basics are natural scientific but now there's a more a more balanced uh, sort of range of courses you can take if you want to be an agronomist in Sweden at least. Okay. But I'm, I'm trained in natural sciences okay. but I made my PhD on organic farming and the development of organic farming in Europe and Austria more particularly and that's a, a purely social scientific uh, PhD. I, okay. I made. So I, I, I took an interest in the in the in the farmers. So how they were thinking about sustainability issues, and how that resonated within the organic re organic regulation of the European Union and the organic movement as such, and how organics has moved from a, a very peripheral and alternative social movement to something more institutionalized and what happens on the way. So that's mm -hmm. part of what I'm still interested in is how, how we can scale up sustainable or, or possibly sustainable solutions, but still without losing the, the, the core of the sustainability issues that are embedded in them. It's because it very often happens that when retailers or, or large scale actors or that are mainly interested in the profits sort of take this to their hearts, you might lose some of the qualities that we're interested in. And of the core values, yes. I, I guess. Yes. So that's one of my topics. And then I'm okay. also interested in the relation between producers and consumers. So producers of food who sort of try to bypass all the intermediaries, intermediaries between themselves and the consumers and what happens then. So do consumers learn more about food production? And mm -hmm. is that good for for the development of the farm, sustainability, okay. and so on. And when I when I was reading about your work, uh, I was reminded, of course, about of uh, permaculture. Yes. Is that something that because I, I couldn't find it in the description of what you do, it, that, that struck me. So, are you? Is this something you're interested in, or? Yes. You? Well, uh, yes. It's very closely connected to what we, in more scientific speech, we would say agroecology. Agroecology is, I would say, a field of research. It's very wide and it's not very well defined, but it's a word that we use mm -hmm. for agricultural systems that are try to sort of optimize sustainability issues or mimic nature, natural ecosystems. Which is pretty much permaculture. Exactly. Right? So perma permaculture originated from another corner of the world. So it's more like from people who are involved in trying to design farming or, or the systems to, to, for food production. But I think they're very closely related and uh -huh. I, I privately I take a large interest in permaculture. Okay, cool. 
Kevin, could you uh, elaborate a little bit on your uh, research? My research. <coughs> or anything you want to share. <laughs> well, I guess my, my research background really is a mongrel. Um, I don't really know what I want to be when I grow up, so I've gone into various different things like oceanography and atmospheric science, and mm -hmm. engineering. Um, I'm, I'm most interested in, in how we humans affect the planet around us, um, try to quantify that, that what our effects have and, and the, the consequences of them on the planet, um, mostly from an atmospheric point of view, but, but not only that. Um, so we typically um, build instruments and fly them on research aircraft or shoot them up on rockets or even on occasion put them on a satellite and shoot them up into space and, and try to, to measure and monitor uh, what, we're, what we're doing and what we're doing to the planet and how the planet works as a system. Mm -hmm. um, and then beyond that, um, I've become more and more interested in sustainability from a systemic perspective. Which means? Which means not just looking at one thing at a time, not just looking at, for instance, climate and climate okay. change. Or and this is something that connects, a, this yeah, is something that connects exactly. both of you, you're both systems right. thinkers, right? Precisely. You're thinking Precisely. about connections between things instead yeah. of... And oftentimes it's those connections, that network picture, that and the complexity um, that really becomes the... the, the essence of, of a problem and, and I think you know a lot of in a lot of cases um, we, we tend to want to simplify things whereas if we embrace complexity rather than trying to ignore it then all of a sudden new solutions and new kinds of solutions become available to us or become apparent to us mm -hmm. so and in the last few years I've, I've had the pleasure of doing consulting work with, with a number of rather large companies and, and I'm finding that the private sector is actually more receptive than, than many other sectors to to approaching complex issues as complex issues and, and not simply it? cutting them up into little pieces and okay. and doing th one thing at a time. That's interesting. Yeah, it's probably also how you bring it to the table. Yeah. right? you can make it very uh, well. It is complex, yeah. but you can make it very unclear. Um, do you think that, uh, for example, in climate sci science, because that's where complexity is also fully embraced? it becomes also a weakness in discussion around climate change, for example, that it's actually used against science because it's like people start, how to put it, um, you can use it against, all right. I mean, you, yeah. can, you can spin it, you can start spinning it in all kinds of directions. That's what you see, especially in America, where people that are against climate science start questioning that all the, the complexity right. of it because it's, it's not transparent anymore. There is no direct cause and effect, and right. so you can just... Well, you know, there's two aspects to that, I think. And our, <clears throat> our, our community, the climate science community, has, has not done ourselves any favors by always talking first about uncertainty. Okay. So we come up with a new model or a new that set of observations and, yeah. and a huge new report, and, and the first word that comes out of, of somebody's mouth talking about it is, well, the uncertainty is, you know, it's a little bit less than that. And Which is very scientific. It's very that's scientific. What science, right. Scientists do. You because know, they're always aware of the precisely. We yeah, we'd the, like to minimize statistics. uncertainty, but but that's different from complexity. Okay. And I think the mistake that that in communication that the science, the climate science community is still making, but perhaps less so than we used to, is is not sort of untwining, unpacking the difference between complexity and uncertainty. Could you briefly? Well, complexity. Yeah. So so you you might know uh, how something works uh, in, in some level of detail. Mm -hmm. um, and you might not be sure, if, if I were to turn a knob two notches, um, I might not sure, be sure if, if the resulting change in, say, the temperature of the room, if it's a thermostat, goes up a lot or a little. And I can, I can say I'm, I'm not certain exactly, I'm uncertain exactly to, to the exact increase. Uh, it could be this much or it could be that much. That's, that's kind of uncertainty. Complexity is, if, if you're thinking about the Earth system, that, as you mentioned, you know, the, the direct cause and, and effect relationship's gone. Okay. But the cool thing there about uncertainty, or excuse me, about complexity, um, is that there are, there are new tools and new vocabulary about complexity science and, and complex networks and, and, and how complex systems actually work that allow us to not simplify or ignore complexity, but deal with it as a complex system. And I'm finding that that, that particular language really resonates with folks in the private sector. Okay. That makes sense. So today is going to be about the future of space exploration. So 
Rebecca, what's your? Do you have an interest in space exploration, is it, or does it seem like really remote for you? Uh, uh, to be honest. Yes, yes sure, yes. of course. That's uh, why we're here. Sort of remote. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm busy, well, spending most of my time working with trying to figure out and think about solutions here on Earth. On Earth. Mm -hmm. There's so much to do, and there's so much we can do, and there's of so course, many yeah. solutions that we haven't tried out and that we don't try out enough and that are not allowed to emerge because of different things that happen and our power issues and things like that. But um, Do I hear some skepticism <laughs> about space exploration? Uh, I mean, I know some uh, people question it. Well, it's I don't have a very strong view. View on it. Okay. Uh, but it's, and I wouldn't say I would forbid it or anything, okay. but it's, um, uh, and it's fascinating, of course. I mean, it's, it's, it's very... It triggers our, I mean, the, the part of the brain that wants to, you know, be triggered in that sense, like the science fiction sense, or what's possible, and, and our place in, in the universe in the and universe. things like that. Uh, but also, I, I would sort of, my, another reaction from my part would be like, well, with a lot of money, with a lot of energy, you can, you can do most anything, if you just work long enough. So it's not a matter of what we can do, but it's more like, should we? Or what are the resources well spent and things like that? Yeah, but uh, yes, but I don't want to be a boring person here. <laughs> no, 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 you don't have to be. No, no, you can be critical, yeah, you know, it's it, healthy. What's interesting when I started thinking about this, this uh, conversation is like the, the link then between systems that need to be re, how do you say? I don't know, I don't want a native speaker. So have to regenerate themselves. Mm -hmm. So ecologies that have to be autonomous in a yes, sense, we'll, or, we'll or start talking about like whole that. ecologies in a sense. So that's, mm -hmm. that's where space can be an interesting experimental place mm -hmm. because we, you, you're totally isolated and you have to be totally yes. self-sustaining. So mm -hmm. that's interesting in a way. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, and Kevin, you already mentioned you're actually working mm -hmm. actively in space. I mean, you're mm -hmm. using space yeah. to do all the atmospheric research. Let me get to the, the first topic that I wanted to bring up. Um, when you look at the, uh, the, the, the way our future on Mars, for example, is visualized, and more specifically how agriculture is visualized on Mars, you very often find images of greenhouses preferably domes, like the dome we're sitting in here, pretty much exactly like this, with a transparent dome. And then you see these, these bird-eye view images with a green dome shining on the sur red surface of Mars, which generates beautiful visuals, of course. Now, it's my contention that this is actually quite wrong. I mean, that this will probably not really happen. I mean, there are many reasons why it would probably be difficult to build nice greenhouses. Um, first of all, the sunlight intensity is much lower on Mars. It's about 60%. Um, it's also unpredictable, the light, because of the dust storms that happen on Mars. And then there is the issue of radiation, of course. So I believe that if we're going to grow food on Mars, it's going to be pretty much growth chambers, which are much more controlled. Uh, and when I look at the developments in contemporary agriculture, the high-tech developments, like in Holland, for example, um, there is an incredible development of lighting technology and, and uh, autom automation systems where uh, with sensors and nutrient management fully automated. This seems to me the way that we will start growing our food. Um, I just wanted to hear your opinion. If you imagine like astronauts growing their food on Mars, what kind of ideas pop up in your mind? Well, immediately I think, you know, you get the same pictures that, of agricultural fields, right? Uh, and that's kind of the same mistake that that you know the, the British expansion when when Britain was a big empire, you know, taking the same plants and, and putting them in, in in ecosystems that those plants simply did not grass. You know, a nice grass lawn and, and oak trees don't belong in a desert ecosystem, for instance. So I kind of agree with you that that if we're going to have agriculture or food, don't call it agriculture, call it food production on on another planet, then then that's going to look it should look a lot different than food production does here on this planet. Mm -hmm. because the, the systems are completely different. And I guess from a, a systemic or a resilience point of view, it seems that, that you'd want to, to try to establish a regenerative system. Uh, and from an ecosystem's point of view, in, in which you know, whatever components of that system, whatever waste stream you have is somebody else's raw material. Um, and, and that would make it look quite different. 
You know, you wouldn't be growing big leafy plants. You might be producing algae, and from that algae, you could then combine it and, and turn it into a protein or mm-hmm. something of the sort, right? Exactly. Um, but it would, I would, I would suspect that it would look quite different, and we're yeah. not going to have these big corn fields on Mars. No, no, no. But don't and don't underestimate the psychological effect of a leafy plant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Having a, a tiny piece of lettuce right. during an isolation mission. I mean, I did uh, a few isolation missions, both at the Mars Desert uh-huh. Research Station and for high seas. And then being able to even eat this tiniest leafy vegetable that you've tried to grow for uh, some time, that's something we did in uh, the Mars Desert Research Station. It's very gratifying. Mm. It has a huge psychological But that's effect. probably not your but main... That, but that's source, not going right? to be the main crop. Yeah. That's not providing right. you the calories. You right. know, that's just uh, right. the, the extra. Um, yeah, salad. Rebecca, what's, what's your, uh, what's your yes, contention When I think here? about food production on Mars, I th- I, I, it has to be high-tech. In a way. It has to be yeah. high-tech. Well, it's, I, that's the way I think about it, because I can't really visualize anything that's low-tech or because it's a hard... And what do you mean? Well, maybe Mars. explain a little bit what do you mean with high-tech? How a lot you? of energy and, and the human enterprise behind it before you can actually do it, because it's not happening by itself. I mean, here on Earth, we have production of plants or, or animals that happen by themselves, and we okay. sort of mimic that or take that into our... We model around, we model around with it, and we try to you know, increase production for our benefit. But on Mars, even if there's water or not, I don't know, but it has to be totally external, and for me, then high tech systems that are totally controlled by us. And even if they might be re- regenerative, they have to be introduced, and all the resources have to be put there because there, there's nothing right now that can be transformed into something so that all we the, So everything has to be monitored and all the streams of all the products have to be very controlled and followed up and That's screened. That's how I imagine it. I mean, okay. We have to put it there first of all. And I also think algae, I think about, or like small insects maybe. Yes. I mean, uh, that's Insect another discus- discussion what we actually want, would like to eat. I, th- I agree that a green plant is extremely gratifying, even if you don't mm-hmm. isolate, if you just, <laughs> if you're not, McDonald's diet for a week, you will <laughs> yearn for green leafy. Not stuff. everyone, though. Yeah, no, okay, okay. <laughs> anyway, um, or small, like, I mean, if you want to animal protein, like small animals, like insects, or maybe some water tanks of small fish or sh- shell, shells, or um, yeah, maybe green algae too. I'm not. I don't know. Like how spirulina, for example. Exactly, spirulina yeah, is a very edible, yeah, edible yeah, algae. Even yeah. chlorella. But mm. um, the tricky thing with the algae is that you need to process them, process them mm. pretty heavily before right. they become digestible, okay. and they mm. don't taste very well. So mm. you know. So you have to hide them somehow. Yeah, you need to work with that. Yeah, but, but you know, it's, yeah, it's perfectly this, possible. Uh, I think it's called hydroponics. But could you could you yeah. could you elaborate a little mm. more on what you mean specifically with high tech? You know, what kind of technology? Just to give the listener a bit of more of a visual picture how it would look like so you probably also don't believe it's going to be a greenhouse right or do you i mean well well i don't know so much about mars but okay. as you said it's the, the the solar radiation is is lower so you, it's not the it's light not, intensity is exactly. lower yeah. so that the radiation yeah, is pretty intense yeah sorry <laughs> there's, yeah, there's totally different uh, conditions than mm-hmm. here so you can't just put the glass house there but the way you i could imagine is i agree with you that there are automatic and there's a lot of things you can do with water and nutrients and cir- circulation and but so if we if we have to imagine a system mm-hmm. like this it's like sensors are measuring for example the sap streams in the plant they're measuring the nutrients in the water and then based on that there's a system that decides how many nutrients needs to be added to the water unless a human person being is there to do it to instead do of it. the machine how, what, well. how do you feel about automation and robotics in farming do you think that's going to be part of our future in farming both it on is, earth and in space it is already part of it i okay. mean there's something called precision agriculture what is that that's where you try to use modern technology like gps uh, and measurements in, in the soil for, for example in one large field there might be different um, amounts of phosphorus or different types of soil types that will need different types of nutrients to, to grow the same crop. So with this like monitoring and information technology basically and, trans- and using this information, you can be more precise about what you actually put on the crop to make them grow optimally, including water than in other contexts than in Sweden maybe. 
Um, and also the machines you use, like the tractors themselves, can monitor and f sort of feel or sensor what they, where they are and what they experience. So you can have, um, and also the application of if you use pesticides, how exactly on the right okay. timing, like the stage of this pest, for example, in the larvae stage, or it, is it the sounds, egg stage. It, it sounds like big data applied yes, to yes, agriculture. Yes, so you apply yeah. it and you yeah. use it to, to, to reduce the resources you need for farming. Yeah. It's not aware? the same sort of. So, sorry, it's not the. That's another way to sort of go to try to reach a more sustainable agriculture than the organic way, for yes. example. They These have are two paradigms, thinkings. right? Yes. There is a tech, the more technology-oriented paradigm of yeah. improving our way we we, we live on Earth through mm -hmm. technology. That technology is going to save us from all mm -hmm. uh, the bad things that are happening here. And then there is the. The permaculture approach, I, I think, and the organic, the organic, or, or the, the people are much more about going back closer to nature again. And mimicking nature more. And mimicking nature. Directly it's using probably, I, 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 like in most of these conversations, mm -hmm. it's probably going to be a combination of both approaches exactly. that is going to be mm -hmm. the, the future. Are you aware that in Wageningen uh, University, people are growing plants on Martian soil and on lunar soil? Um, so this is an experiment that it's, it's, it's been going on for, uh, for quite some time now. So basically what they did was they, um, they created soil simulants. So these are soils, artificial Mars soil and artificial lunar soil. And then based on the composition of the soils on Mars and on the moon, they selected plants that they, would, that they suspected would grow on it based on the, on the nutrients that are in those soils. Um, and they actually successfully grew those plants, they germinated, they flowered, they produced seeds, uh, different crops were grown, uh, tomatoes was grown, uh, wheat, cress, all these kind of plants. Um, I wonder if this is, I mean this is part of this, this more older vision of you know you're almost going to do traditional farming on Mars. And, I mean for me it looks more like we would, we would actually go to more systems like hydroponics which is mm -hmm. much more controlled and you would actually not really need that soil. But I would just love to hear your opinion about um, the fact that we're currently growing plants in these uh, in these soils <clears throat> seems to me to be a little bit of a, a, a chimera, is in in the sense that well, there's a couple of things. There there's the amount of food nourishment calories that you would need to produce to to keep you alive on Mars, mm -hmm. and, and and I really don't see that coming from from a tomato plant. There's the kind of food that you would want to grow to keep you sane on Mars, yeah, and that's the tomato plant. Okay. And, and so I would, I'd see as, as two different things, really, that one system or set of systems that you would establish to, to produce what you need to survive, uh, and another, another system or set of systems that you would produce or need to, to produce the stuff that keeps you, keeps you from going bananas. Mm -hmm. um, and what would, would, what be, would be a good approach to provide you with uh, a good amount of calories? Is it like the potatoes, like in the Martian from Andy Weir? Would that be an approach? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm a little intrigued because, you know, it seems we're talking about uh, the systems, the agricultural or food production systems that you would need um, to produce enough calories and, and the, the need for all kinds of sensors and monitoring. That, that implies that you know well enough how those complex systems work that you can monitor and, and measure everything that you need to know to optimize it. And, and I'm, one of the things I'm curious about is, is that I'm not sure that we can, we're smart enough to design those systems completely. That, that in complex systems, there's a, a degree of unpredictability mm -hmm. that, that you can try to nurture. But you can, co you can compensate for that by having humans constantly right. doing, well, yeah. co monitoring right. the system. Or, right? or you it's could, not like we're going to leave it up to a computer right. and a robot, and yeah. then sure. two months later we show up and, like, hey, where's Oops. our food? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm just thinking that, that in terms of if you design a system, where, where, again, you think from a, a, an ecological or an ecosystem point of view, and, and you have a diversity not only of species, which kind of correlates with how, how stable or how resilient ecosystems are, but also a, a functional diversity. So if conditions change, if, if everything in your ecosystem responds the same way, then it becomes unstable, right? So it's too, it's too sensitive. It's, yeah, well, yeah, it could be. But if you have not only a difference in species, so let's let's say you had a bunch of different kinds of algae and plants and stuff in your in your Martian uh, cube, you don't have a greenhouse. It's going to be like a green cube or something. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so so if they if they all re all those different components responded in the same way to a difference in radiation or a difference in temperature or that big 
dust storm that, that goes past, then that system starts to oscillate. It starts to, to yeah. become unstable. Sure. Whereas if, if you had components that reacted differently, some of them produce more, some of them produce less, but they would stabilize. They tend to be a that makes more stable. That makes so much sense. Yeah. And yeah. Then, yeah. then I think in terms of, of rather than, than trying to be able to monitor and measure everything, because there's always something you're going to forget, right? Um, I'm wondering, and I don't have an answer to this, but I'm just wondering if, if we could create systems that are inherently uh, resilient in that way and let them, let them be in, as intelligent or as dumb as they need to be. Can I add something? Yeah, I think that the large um, the challenge would be to make something that will survive in the longer term because here on Earth, where we have so many supporting ecosystems and so many supporting species like pests. What do you mean with supporting species? Like, like insects that eat pests that would eat our wheat, for example. We have so that. So it's, it's, it's biological diversity. diversity around the agricultural exactly. field, well, field that kind exactly. of contributes to its productivity. That will help to stabilize it because the, the, the number of species, that, as you said, that reacts in different way, uh, would eat different things, would stabilize it. Because we, even if we use a lot of pesticides, we're not totally dependent on them. We're more, more dependent on pollinators like bees. And if all of these things disappear, which would they would they would wouldn't be there on Mars. So we have to have a system that's either, as I said, very high tech because we have to insert all these stabilizing factors, then, or because we can't rely on sort of surrounding nature, surrounding systems to support our system. So okay. that's why. Mm -hmm has to be very so you, you high tech system. or you would introduce different species to support that with yeah, that then you need a lot lot of more space and then you need mm -hmm. more space okay. of course. but it seems you know it seems the, the it seems to me that the, the way to go would be rather than to try to grow lots of different stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. grow a couple of things one thing uh, and and be able to change that one thing into different forms be able to creatively you know make a a hamburger patty out of whatever goo it is that you're you're growing, and then then you know make a nice soup out of it or something like that, rather than try to reproduce the the yes. diversity of stuff products that we that's have. That's pushing technology even further, sure. of course. Yeah. But you know, at Wageningen, another thing that's going on in Wageningen is is the production of protein uh, from from chemical components. Okay. So so there's a research group there that's, that's making meat mm -hmm. that looks and tastes and feels like meat. Which it, would be good. Yeah. Once again, going back to my experience when I was uh, in high season uh, doing the Mars four month Mars simulation, um, and we did we actually did a nutrition study. It's a four month long nutrition study, and the interesting thing, and it's uh, we were not the only ones that kind of came up with this, but uh, comfort food mm. is what is becomes really really mm. important, uh, both for individual psychology, um, but also for group dynamics because mm. people love to share stories about food. And we were allowed, for example, to cook our own meals, starting mm -hmm. from ingredients. And we always were cooking with two. And then the, the psychological and social benefit of having two crew members right. sharing stories over their creative cooking and then sharing the meal with the crew and getting feedback mm -hmm. from that is very different than the cliches about right. space food sure. coming out of tubes. So there's, there's probably going to be a sort of balance that needs to be struck. What we also noticed is that you don't always want to cook. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you actually need a ready meal because yeah. you don't have time and yeah. you don't want to be bothered about it. So it's, you know, it's usually, like I said before, it's usually a combination of mm -hmm. things. Um, the calorie conversation is, a, is an interesting one. Um, you know about the Mars One program, the Dutch program that wants to send astronauts to Mars, uh, which will be part of a reality TV um, show. That's where their funding comes from. And the idea is to launch astronauts uh, in different stages to Mars and to have them settle on Mars. They will never come back. And they're serious about this. Um, it's quite famous because it garnered a lot of media attention and there were like 200,000 people that registered to apply for the, uh, for to, 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 uh, to go along, uh, to, to go to Mars. Um, and one of the things is, of course, they get a lot of criticism as well, as much as they're very uh, almost utopian in their hopes of, you know, being the first ones to settle Mars. Um, and one of the criticisms came from MIT. Students in 2014 did some analysis on their plans, how to keep the astronauts alive. And part of those plans is growing food. And the calories were a problem. Um, Rebecca, I would, I would love to hear from you 
what's up with calories? How do we how do we handle that? Because that's a big that's a big question. I mean, it's like Kevin said, it's all good and well to talk about tomatoes and lettuce and everything, but that's not the core question. No, that's true. Uh, I totally agree. It's um, um, it's about the bulk food, and that's enough. I mean, it's obvious when you look around the world what you need and what you what you don't need. I don't know. Like you, 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 you probably won't be feasible to bring animals to that will be bred and, and slaughtered. I suppose. Um, so yeah, it's a very hard question. I have I don't have calculations what you actually what would be enough like insects or algae or what this spicy food we're talking about. Um, so we basically the carbohydrates and the proteins and the proteins yes, that is yes. really important. The fat, the and fat. the fat. Yeah. So it has to be a balanced diet and with this comfort food in combination with this. M- vitamins too. Yeah, yeah. vitamins, yeah. yes, yes. Right. But you can, yeah. The vitamins you could supply you could s- using pills, I guess, from Earth. You could, you could, you could. Yeah, but probably less effective than if mm. you read real food. Fresh real food. F- mm. Vitamins, yeah. 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 But, I mean, it depends how long, for a long time period you want to survive like this. Mm-hmm. I think you can. You know, the other thing that, that we take for, for granted, I, I think, is, is we're exporting stuff to Mars, right? But, but that's a little bit uh, arrogant, isn't it, that, that we can just dump Mars with all of our insects and that type of thing. It's a different planet. And, and yes, of course. I think it needs to, we need to sort of keep in mind that, that if we think about this seriously, then, then we have to think about us not recreating uh, or creating mistakes on, well, on a this, new, this, this actually, completely new planet. Right? This brings me to um, a hot topic right now which, uh, because a few days ago, NASA announced the detection of liquid water on the surface of Mars, which is a, a, a pretty big discovery. And now there's this whole discussion in the scientific community what to do with that discovery. Because, of course, there are many scientists that want to drive curiosity up to that water and just start sampling it or analyzing it. Um, the problem is curiosity might not be perfectly, it's quite sure, it's not perfectly sterile. So there's bacteria on that rover. So if you send the rover to the water on Mars, you might start infecting the water, and then the cat is out of the box. Mm-hmm. It's you know it's game over. The the entire planet will slowly be colonized by Earth uh, by could be colonized by bacteria from Earth. So there's a huge discussion right now on planetary protection, which is completely. Uh, I mean, I honestly don't see how we can have very strict planetary protection rules and then having a settlement on Mars, which where, where food production is taking place, where human waste being produced, I honestly don't see how we're gonna ever going to balance that. So I'm not sure which direction this is going to go, but mm. what are your opinions about, about this issue of planetary protection? And I, well, it's maybe like more you said, like an ethical... An it ethical is an ethical, question. and I just think that, that you know, if, if we decide that we want to explore other planets, and, and not only explore them, but actually go and live on them, mm-hmm. Then, then we are, like you said, saying that, that we, we will be, if not terraforming that planet, we will be permanently changing it from, from its current condition. Um, and I just think that we need to, to as, as a species, ponder that a little bit and say, okay, if, if we do that, cool, um, we can do that. And I'm, I'm kind of curious. I, I don't know that we can stop ourselves. I think mm-hmm. when we started earlier about talking about exploration, space exploration, I think the one of the main reasons for me to, to be exploring space is because that's what we are, we're explorers. You know, our species is an exploring species. Um, it's part of our nature. And, and we, space exploration isn't because we're gonna learn how to produce new widgets here on Earth more efficiently. That's, mm-hmm. that's uh, excuse, well, I was gonna say a nasty word, but that's not a good argument. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it is because we can, we can learn more about, about how our planet works and how we might make our us and our existence here on this planet um, sustainable and, and flourishing mm-hmm. if we were to pay attention to what that, that means by transporting us somewhere else. Yeah. And, and so I just think that, that I would like us to, to think a little bit more through the, the ethical implications of moving to another planet uh, because that will permanently change that planet. Rebecca, do you have uh, Yeah, I agree. It's an ethical question and, and it, the big question is who's going to say and what's what's right and wrong because there's no ownership issues. I mean, there is something like space law and space treaties, but, yeah. you know. If the Dutch are the first, they will be the first and nobody will decide. Yeah, I have no them. idea how yeah. they will handle mm-hmm. that. Yeah. yeah, and put the flag there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, it solves the sea level rise problem, right? Just, there you go. 
uh, if it's but personally from a very personal yeah, point of view yeah. do you think we should we should do this we should con we should con basically contaminate a planet with organisms from earth well, it totally depends on what's there already. So if mm -hmm. there's water and if there's some potential life, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a more complex issue than if it was just a barren because piece we, of earth. Because what we would bring could mm -hmm. threaten life yes. on yes. Mars. And yes. it's basically, we, we could cause extinction exactly. of existing life. Exactly. But and then we're starting yes. all over again. We're yes. doing exactly the same what we've been doing yes. before. So it's, it's not, uh, I mean, it wouldn't be, okay. I think it's... Um, some people talk about, oh, we have to explore different planets to, to sort of start appreciating our own planet and so on, mm -hmm. or, or start sort of exploring and extracting resources to make our That's lives better here, focus, which yes. is something very problematic, I think. I think we should From make do with our own planet mm -hmm. and try to, to sort of organize ourselves. Yeah, I agree with that completely. <laughs> it's, you know, the going to another planet mm -hmm. isn't so that it's a brand new resource mm -hmm. source. Mm -hmm. um, there must be there must be better reasons for going to the problem is if you look at the history of humanity the reason that we've been exploring is mostly to find either new mm. resources well to find new resources and to expand territories which i think is going to come into play anyhow from that point of view i think that you know i'm a little scratching my head because you know what's what's the impetus for going to mars rather than going to the moon for instance mm -hmm. if exactly. you want to go and, and create a, a new human settlement in a really inhospitable place well the moon's closer, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and it doesn't appear to have water. And it mm -hmm. there are a lot of space yeah. agencies that want to go to the moon first mm -hmm. before they move to Mars. Uh, just to conclude the conversation, I mean, if we're talking about um, bringing ecology into outer space, about farming in space, the image of biosphere two comes up. The experiment in the '90s in Arizona, where um, miniature ecosystems were built under glass greenhouse structures, and then people were locked up in there. Uh, assuming that the whole system, including people, would sustain itself, which didn't work out for many several reasons, for both technical reasons, social reasons, biological reasons. Um, would love to hear your opinion about what this was all about and whether it was a, a good idea to begin with to approach uh, colonizing outer space with this kind of paradigm, because it's a very particular paradigm. If you compare it, for example, to the MELISA program, which is a regenerative ecosystem developed by the European Space Agency, they take a complete different approach, which is strictly, um, how to put it, you basically focus on all the molecules that come out of an astronaut body, you pick, you pick them up, you throw them through a sequence of bacterial uh, compartments, and you turn them into nutrients for plants again that produce oxygen and food. And the resulting system does not look at all like a natural ecosystem, but it does what needs to be done. That's a different paradigm. Biosphere was all about visually recreating Earth and then hoping that it would all, all work. So maybe to conclude, a little uh, opinions about, yeah. about this quite spectacular failure. Right. Well, it, it failed in a similar way than the Viking settlements on Greenland failed, right? They, they tried to take their, their vision and their ecosystem and, and their system with them. Can you elaborate a little bit? Well, on that? yeah, it was, you know, in, in the, the medieval warm period when, when Eric the Red and all the other Vikings were out sailing around, there was a, a couple of settlements that were, that were established on the coast of Greenland. Um, and they thrived for a short while, but then when weather went back to normal again or the climate move back into a more normal regime for Greenland, uh, then they couldn't have sheep and they couldn't farm crops and, and they didn't want to eat seals like the Inuit did. So because they were unable to get rid of that cultural baggage, they didn't survive. And, and that's kind of the impression I get from, from the biosphere experiment was it was trying to, to make the shiny vision of, of exactly the same kind of ecosystems that you could, you could see if you stepped outside. Um, but just put them inside and encapsulate them. And I think from a, from a real point of view, then, then I'm much more enthusiastic in, uh, about the Melissa type approach because that's, that's one that says, okay, how do, how do ecosystems work? What Rather than let's, let's, let's capture a particular one and just put it in I the think bubble. Let's to, just to continue with that, I think one of the main problems, because I'm an ecologist, is that the whole idea of reducing an ecosystem type to a small miniature version, it doesn't make any sense at all from an ecological point of view and from a complexity point right. of view. Creating a mini ocean. How could you create a mini ocean in a swimming pool? This is by, this by no way will behave like an ocean, right. of course. Right. And so because 
you can generate that huge complexity that we're, we know from, from Earth, uh, the system becomes very unstable. Mm. If you right. give it one push and the whole thing collapses, that's right. and that's what happened in biosphere. Right. Most of those ecosystems collapsed and they got overrun by pests like mm -hmm. ants and cockroaches started taking over. Moreover, for example, uh, oxygen got absorbed by the concrete in the structure, which they didn't account for. So the whole thing just started slowly to right. deteriorate. But I think from an ecological point of view, that was really the, the I think personally, the most problematic uh, thing that they were recreating ecosystems not so much from a functional point of view what they do but how they look like and then and this is interesting uh, also from a cultural point of view because the people that were behind the project mm. actually had a background background in performance and performance art oh interesting which okay. makes sense which yeah. makes sense because they it was all about uh, performance but i would also love to hear from rebecca your perspective yeah. that must well, be a really interesting case uh, study for you Yes, but I haven't studied it. But I think it's very interesting because mistakes are also very oh, well, or failures are extremely interesting. Because it now you, we can explain why it why it failed and the different reasons, of course. So scale is extremely important. Complexity is important, and um, and yeah, as you said, the human interaction is important because it can happen on Mars too. Of course, people who are there are there. There won't be a sort of a shuttle going back and forth very, at least not very fast. So you have to sort of come up with social solutions or cultural solutions that work also when you do things. And also scaling up and scaling down uh, will be important if you want to produce, if you would like to produce food in space. Because you, if you have, if something works here on one scale, you want to scale it up, a lot of things happen and it stabilizes or unstable systems and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, uh, it, it's interesting. And, uh, and of course, I mean, Something that works on a large scale will not work on the same way in the small scale, and vice versa. Yeah, right. So scale issues, I think we learn a lot by the looking at this. Yes, that's mm -hmm. that's how many people look at the biosphere experiment. That in, in, even though it was a bit of a, a failure, actually we learned we learned a lot, mm -hmm. and that's in the end how we'll find our way throughout the universe. And this could also say something about if we deplete and destroy our own biodiversity on the large scale, cockroaches and ants will run us over, or yes. things like yeah. That they mm. might, yeah, <laughs> they might rule the earth after yeah. all. Yeah. Anyhow, I think we're going to conclude here. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Kevin, for this wonderful conversation about uh, space farming and bringing ecology into outer space. Thank you, Angela. Thank you.